Yeah, I am on. Okay, good. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. It's good to have you all here. Uh, just a word about when we're singing. Uh, if you'd notice, like under our gathering hymn, we're dividing the verses up in various ways. Sometimes it's high voices or low voices. Sometimes it might be the piano side or the lectern side. So please just look for those little helpful notes underneath the hymns so that we kind of make a joyful noise to the Lord and mix it up a little bit and have some fun. So welcome again. It's good to have you all here. This is our first Sunday for having uh, Heidi with us, our Gustavus Adolphus College music scholar, Heidi Engman. So welcome to Heidi and her family. It's good to have you here. And thank you for your musical contributions in the life of First Lutheran. So if you'd please rise as together we sing Canticle of the Turning. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. 
accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we hear Nancy Tim share her temple talk. Good morning. As a member of the council, we wanted um, some chat with you about our, um, well, we passed a $15,000 deficit budget. So how can we as a council support the congregation in making up some of that deficit in ways other than pledges? 
We thank you for your pledges. Keep them coming. Keep them on time. That's great. However, that's not going to cut it, which is why we have a deficit budget. So the council has formed an ad hoc committee for fundraising um, that I'm heading, I guess. And one of the things we wanted to remind you of is our Quick Trip card program, our Family Fresh card program, and the receipt programs for Family Fresh. Just a little background information. Um, kind of before this last little break that we've started now um, with Quick Trip, the break that we just finished, we had done Quick Trip for eight years and earned $7,200 selling Quick Trip cards. And in four years of doing Family Fresh Receipts, we had earned $780. Um, so the Quick Trip cards and the Family Fresh cards work. You pay the church the face value of the cards. They come in $50 and $100 increments. And then you go shopping and buy your groceries or your gas. And here's a chance for your money to do double work because you're going to spend that money anyway. You get your gas, you get your groceries, but a percentage of that has already been donated to the church. So it's not an extra donation. It's part of what you're already spending. The thing with the Quick Trip uh, or Family Fresh Receipts is it's crucial you use your Yes card, which gets you extra discounts in the store. It's free to sign up. You just have them wand it before you run your food through the register. And then those receipts that have the Quick or the Yes card on them count as a third way that your money is working. So you got your groceries, you got the donation for buying the Family Fresh card, and you're turning in your receipt with the yes card indicator on it. So that money is doing three jobs instead of just buying your groceries. The other thing is the shop with script. Now this is something new for our congregation. It works like you're buying in advance and there are hundreds of retailers. There is a list out in the um, gathering space that you can take. It's everything from 1-800-Flowers, The Gap, restaurants, Menards, Home Depot, all those places. If you're going to shop, let your money do double work. Buy the card in advance, then spend your money at the store. These are ways that we can let our money work twice as hard and even three times as hard and benefit our church. Every little bit counts to offset that deficit. Thank you. A reading from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The psalm will be sung responsibly by verse. Planted by 
by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. reading from 1 Corinthians. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The first musical I ever attended and still enjoy to this day is Fiddler on the Roof. Perhaps you know and enjoy this stirring, funny, and insightful musical. Fiddler on the Roof is a musical with music by Jerry Bach, lyrics by Sheldon Harnick, and book by Joseph Stein. It is set in the context of Imperial Russia in or around the year 1905. It is based on Tevya and his daughters. 
The story centers on Tevya, a milkman in the village of Anatevka. Tevya tries mightily to maintain his Jewish religious and cultural traditions as outside influences encroach upon his family's lives. He must cope with the strong-willed actions of his three older daughters who wish to marry for love. Their choices of husbands are successively less palpable for Tevya. At the end of the musical, an edict from the Tsar eventually evicts the Jews from their village. If you have seen this musical, then you know the great song that it opens with called Tradition. In this song, everyone's role is specific, clearly spelled out, and no one deviates from their assigned roles. Here are some of the lyrics that describe what those roles are. Who day and night must scramble for a living, feed a wife and children, say his daily prayers, and who has the right as master of the house to have the final word at home? The papa, the papa, tradition. Who must know the way to make a proper home, a quiet home, a kosher home? Who must raise the family and run the home so Papa's free to read the holy books? The mama, the mama, tradition. At three, I started Hebrew school. At 10, I learned a trade. I hear they've picked a bride for me. I hope she's pretty. The son, the son, tradition. And who does Mama teach to mend and tend and fix? Preparing me to marry whoever Papa picks, the daughter, the daughter, tradition. You don't want to hear me sing it, trust me. (laughs) As As iconic as these words are, we see that life does not develop and stay so neatly in these exact categories. As the musical continues... Tevya is confronted with societal changes that get bigger as life continues. Each successive daughter breaks a tradition as they fall in love and get married. Tevya struggles with this, but in the end, love wins out. In the end, his love for his daughters outweighs his devotion to his traditions. When the whole world seems to have changed, and when everything seems upside down for Tevya, he remembers what's really important, his love for his family. In our gospel lesson for today from the sixth chapter of Luke, we hear from part of the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus has come down from the mountain and stands on a level place, a plain. There with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people arrayed in front of him, Jesus healed the sick and cast out unclean spirits from those who were suffering. Then he spoke to the masses and proceeded to turn the world on its head. Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will weep and mourn. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. I imagine the good Jewish crowd who were gathered that day to listen to what Jesus had to say were rather stunned by what Jesus was saying. Much like Tevya, when his daughters wanted to choose their own husband, was stunned. Did Jesus really say, blessed are the poor? Blessed are the hungry? Blessed are those who weep and those who are maligned? Did I hear him correctly? 
He can't be serious, right? For the ancient Jews, these were all indicators that, in fact, you were not blessed. If a person was wealthy, healthy, and respected among his or her peers, those were signs they enjoyed God's favor. Those were signs that that person was indeed blessed by God. So conversely, if someone was poor or sickly or held in disrepute by their neighbor, then they were considered to have done something wrong, to have offended God and ended up in the bad situation they found themselves in. Someone must have sinned. That's why they ended up sick. Someone must have broken God's laws. That's why they ended up poor and destitute. Someone did something wrong along the way and their actions finally caught up with them. That's why they ended up in the unfortunate situation they find themselves in now. You see, that was the common mindset in Jesus' time. Righteous and holy people enjoyed God's favor, God's blessing. And outward signs of their blessed state included being wealthy, healthy, and respected by their neighbors. Sinful people were judged as being unrighteous. And outward signs of their immoral lifestyle included poverty, sickness, and being held in disrepute by one's neighbors. As the song tradition in Fiddler on the Roof says, there are specific roles for everyone, and no one must deviate from their assigned role, or else disaster will strike. For the Jews in Jesus' time, there were obvious signs that a person was either blessed by God or not. There really wasn't much wiggle room or discussion to be had. Like the false prophets of the modern-day prosperity gospel proclaim, if you are healthy, wealthy, and successful, then obviously God has blessed you. If you are not those things, then you must be doing something wrong, and you better get straightened out because God wants you to be rich and successful. I assume you have heard people say this. I assume you have heard of the false prophets like Joel Osteen stand up in front of huge crowds preaching this false message, this misleading prosperity gospel. Well, don't fall for it. Do not put your trust in it. Put your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. The problem is, it sells. People fill stadiums to hear this false gospel. Why? Because it fits so well with our modern-day American mindset. In our modern American culture, we would say things like, Blessed are the rich, for they will rule the world. Blessed are the well-fed, for they are the winners. Blessed are the well-respected, those admired by their friends, because clearly they are doing something right. Please note, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said the exact opposite in his Sermon on the Plain. Jesus said that in God's eyes, it is the poor who are blessed. It is the hungry who are blessed. It is those who mourn who are blessed. It is those who are reviled for their faith in Jesus who are blessed. These are the ones whom God calls blessed. Jesus' list is the complete opposite way our world works. And his sermon today makes it seem like everything has turned upside down. Jesus has taken the traditions of his people and turned them on their head. Those who were wealthy, healthy, respected, and enjoying a good life were seen to have been blessed by God. Therefore, the exact opposite meant that some did not enjoy God's favor. The poor, the hungry, those who were sad and mourning, those who found themselves excluded these were viewed as not enjoying God's favor. Which is why today's gospel is so important for us in our modern-day American context. We have our perspective turned upside down. 
We need to start seeing the world and God's children as God does, not the way the world does. Jesus declares that God has a preferential option for the poor. God has a special place in his heart for those who suffer, for those who live on the margins of our society. God cares passionately about those whom our society tends to overlook or ignore. But God sees these individuals, loves them, and they are the ones who enjoy God's favor. They are the blessed ones. And because God favors them, we should take notice of them and care for them ourselves. We who are wealthy, we who enjoy good health, we who have had success and are held in regard by others, we are responsible to look out for our neighbors who aren't so privileged and care for them as Jesus cares for them. I know this seems backwards. It seems like everything is upside down. That is exactly what we need. That change in perspective will help us to see the world as God sees it. When everything seems upside down, we will start to remember who God has special regard for, those who need God's love and care the most. These, our siblings and neighbors, are the ones we are called to notice and care for, just as Jesus did. Amen.
And together, let us join as we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Blessed are those whose trust is in you. Strengthen the faith of those who profess your name and bring reassurance to those who doubt or fear. Through your church, speak continued blessings into the world. God of grace. Those who trust in you are like trees planted by streams of water. Bless fruit trees with an abundant harvest. Protect rainforests from human destruction. Restore land that has eroded after deforestation. Resurrect woodlands after forest fires. God of grace. Send your blessings of mercy upon those who long for consolation. Tend to those struggling with poverty, unemployment, or uncertainty. Provide all who are hungry. Console those who face persecution. Grant peace to all who suffer. God of grace. Renew this congregation in our shared mission. As we plan and dream for the future you are preparing, inspire us by the examples of Martin Luther and all the reformers. Bless new prophets and new ministry partnerships. God of grace. Christ is raised from the dead, and so we cling to the hope of the resurrection. We praise you for the lives of the saints who lived and died in the hope of eternal life with you. God of grace. Since we have such hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Thank you. Our announcements. Again, I want to welcome Heidi Engman as our Gustavus Music Scholar. She's a sophomore working with Dr. Chad Winterfelt, and she's excited to be here with us. And we're excited to have you with us, so thank you very much. On March 6, we will be joined by the Midland University Choir from Nebraska on their choir tour to show them great hospitality from First Lutheran. We would like to send them on their way with a box lunch from Gustavus, which will cost around $600 in total. So if you're willing to contribute to this lunch, please leave a donation labeled lunch money for choir in the offering plates, or you can stop by and leave a check with Karen in the office by March 6. The cost of one meal is $9. Registration forms for chair yoga with Liz Hawkinson are in the gathering space. I've actually done that once. It's pretty fun, <laughs> especially if you're a rookie to yoga. Uh, free will donations will be accepted for Isaiah and their ongoing efforts. Join us for the Bob Ross Painting Challenge. That's going to be Sunday, February 27th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. You can register online. If you have any questions, please contact Callie. Please pray for our delegates who will be attending our Minnesota Valley Conference Assembly next Sunday, February 20th at 2 p.m. at Christ Lutheran Church in Glencoe. As we had our annual meeting as a congregation, the conference has their annual meeting, the Synod has their annual meeting, and we're all bound together as one body of Christ. So it's important that we engage at each level in that body of Christ. We have several individuals to lift up in prayer on our long-term list. We pray for all families who are continuing to adjust to the loss of loved ones. And most recently, we want to lift up Barb Hack and the entire family of Dale Hack, who passed away on February 5th. May God's peace surround and sustain their family. And his funeral will be held at a later date. Those are all the announcements I have. Just looking at our council president to see if we have any other announcements. Okay, now. Um, for those watching at home or in the nursing homes, uh, know that we're all praying for you and we send you our love and our greetings in Christ. So if you please stand now as we sing our sending hymn, Jesus' heart was moved with pity. God who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. 
Amen. Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news.